some opening remarks on what she sees as the importance of this work. Shukran Maha, thank you Maha for this generative introduction about us and the book. Thank you everybody. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak today upon the occasion of the English publication of Adil's Mana important new book, Nakba and Survival. I have long admired Adil's scholarship and career path and I'm humbled to be speaking on his work with my Palestinian colleague Maha. It shouldn't surprise us that after three quarters of century, the subject of the Nakba still deserves the scholarly attention it receives despite already wide coverage across the disciplines. After all, the Nakba as structure endures in the path dependencies of inequality and violence that were institutionalized then and that continue to differentially shape the daily lives of Palestinians today. Manna's book recounts the stories of those Palestinians from Haifa and the Northern Galil amid the traumatic rapture of mass displacement and disposition. Majlik Krum, Manna's own home village, takes center stage as an indexical case in the forced disintegration of Palestinian life. Palestinian responses to disposition and forms of quotidian resistance amid the military rule regime that came to rule over them. Unlike some other recent books, including my own forthcoming one, which tried to explain the Zionist settler colonizer's social action, here the attention lies on the survival of the Palestinian citizens who remained in the homeland, but became subject to a new sovereign power. A meticulous history, no less, Manna is most interested in understanding the depths of suffering and resilience, given all encompassing forms of violence that cut off these population from populations from their society and reshape the contours of their lives forever. Vivid personal accounts add texture to an event that is often told by war of war and battle maneuvers, strategic decision-making by elites and abstracting demographic data on population reshuffling. But like any historical event, the Nakba was experienced day by day by real human beings who couldn't have predicted the scale of what was to come. Understanding the social context that shaped how they carried on their lives despite distraction lends to our knowledge of an un undertold segment of the Palestinians. This rigorous study is based on local historical events or micro histories and does not impose an overarching historiography or comprehensive theory. Instead, it walks us through events as they were experienced, as people imputed meaning to what they witnessed. Thereby, we better understand the specificities on the ground as events unfolded. This doesn't mean the book simply lists out facts in, in chronological order. It implots them within a broader social context or macro history. This is a valuable approach to the study of an event that affected so many, but in different ways. Palestine was stratified already in the late Ottoman period. British imperialism only entrenched indigenous inequalities and produced new ones. It was the Nakba that devastated the whole society. But this devastation was felt differently. I would like to highlight three strengths of the book, especially. The first is that it lends to our understanding of contingent Zionism, by which I mean a political, a political structure that wasn't all encompassing, but responded to indigenous social actions. 
fissures constituted Zionist rule. Manan's detailed reconstruction of the history of the war in the northern regions tells of how numerous actors, the Zionist paramilitaries and eventually state institution, the Arabian Rescue Army, the National Liberation League interacted. How processes unfolded over time in sequence mattered most to whether and how Palestinian, Palestinian remained. Certainly, nothing was inevitable despite differences in power. The outcomes of events were contingent on a range of factors and not on the ununified practices of all capable settler colonial force. In Arabic, is uh, Israel qadir ala kulli shay, or in Hebrew, Israel hakol yachol. The second strength of the book relates to its methodological vantage point. Menar engaged testimonies, memories, memoirs, archival documents from Israeli and Palestinian sources, interviews, and oral history. This is important given the relative dearth of archival data that existed from this period on the Palestinian daily life during periods of fighting, ceasefire, occupation, and military rule. Some sources did exist, but were also destroyed. But comparatively, fewer testimonies were documented closer to the time of events on the Palestinian side. I will note also that literature is a source of importance for the subaltern that can give us further historical and social depth of the Palestinians in Israel, especially considering the repression that occurred with military surveillance. I find that Manaz's own positionality is important here. A child of Majdlik Rum, exiled then to refugee camp in Ain al Hilwi in Lebanon, Mana ultimately infiltrated back into Israel via sea. Eventually, he would excel in his academic studies and earn his doctorate at the Hebrew University. However, like most Palestinian scholars in Israel, he would encounter the great hunting silence over the Nakba. I think this context matters because it likely shaped how Mana came to view the legitimacy of his source materials. Positivist historians like Benny Morris, for instance, like the, like the mainstream in the Israeli academy, still look down upon oral testimonies, preferring Israeli archives. But Mena generatively demonstrates why a combination is not only fruitful, but actually is intellectually necessary. Third, Highlighting the complexity of the lives and circumstances of those who remained al mutabaqun Manna answers a crucial question. How did, tho did those who ultimately remained do so in the micro level? Manna discusses, for instance, how following the ceasefire, Nazareth returned a kind of status quo period in which the municipality municipality restarted operations, this time in cooperation with the Israeli military government, and life returned in a sense to normal. Despite the possibilities of Nazareth residing being expelled, they were able to remain. The colonial cleavages created between Christian and Jewish Zionists became important determinants of who could remain. Menna argues. He further claims that the relation between the Zionist forces and the Druze leadership enabled their remaining in the homeland. Quote, all of the villages they inhabited, the Druze, remained intact and their inhabitants were not subjected to collective punishment. This was largely due to the decision by Israeli leaders to conclude a cooperation agreement with some leaders of this sect on the eve of the creation of the state. Thus, in addition to the case of Nazareth, the treatment that the Druze received is another paradigm for the policy of non-expulsion due to orders from above. 
to guarantee the survival of the Druze villages and their inhabitants due to their cooperation with the victors at an early point in 1948. End of quote. The story of Majdik Room surrender upon the withdrawal of the ARA is especially fascinating, as it reveals the uncertainties that went into decision-making over how to ensure local communities could remain in their homes despite the apparent success of the Zionist forces. Similarly, the case of the Chahur villages in which residents refused to bow down to the expulsion orders and resisted the orders to expel them by gaining time peacefully resisting, asking Gidru's neighbors for assistance and more articulates how the outcome of the outcomes of the Nakba was not solely the discretion of the Zionist victors. This raises a related point. Mana notes that much of the scholarly literature has centered on Palestinian armed resistance and cultural struggles, while he too notes some of these instances and especially reviews the activity of the Communist Party activists, he focused on how the precarious act of return was in itself an act of resistance against forces that attempted to halt mobility, prevent the return of the internally displaced and refugees, and spatially concentrate any remaining and unwanted indigenous. He notes policies and maneuvers, but more importantly, details actual stories of people and villages. In all, a sense is depicted of the sheer confusion, upheaval, and undetermined nature of the period of war and its aftermath. Then the Palestinians simply tried to survive these shifted circumstances. Baqa, or remaining, became the most important feature of their social action. Elsewhere, I turn this habitus of sumut, habitus of steadfastness, by which I mean to describe a cultivated system of disposition, learned habitus, embodied understandings, and a skill set for navigating the violences of the diminution, wherein Palestinians have phenomenologically encountered and learned, learned ways of living on amid frequent violences. Manas' book adds a great amount of historical depth to the literature. While Sabri Jiri's innovative book, published first in Hebrew and then in Arabic and then in English, was about the legal details of control and confiscation, reflecting the mechanisms by which military rule worked, this book is about the relation between political structures and social struggle. We get a more complex study of specific places as processes unfolded. This allows us to unpack the historical conjectures that ultimately shaped who remained and how. When we bring in the indigenous, we get a more complicated picture. One aspect I would like to hear more about is how Manna discusses the Communist Party, Party as collaborators. He has great courage to open the black box on sacred cows in chapter three. He writes, quote, Arab communists were another group that did not consider the establishment of Israel a catastrophe for the Palestinian people based on their class analysis of the conflict and their acceptance of the partition resolution. End of quote. Although the chapter complicates this slightly, I wondered if this statement generalized. Certainly, many Arab members of the party, few of them were also refugees or internally displaced refugees, viewed the Nakba as a catastrophe, even if the cause they identified wasn't solely Zionist settler colonialism, but Arab and European imperialism. I think we need further disaggregation of the membership and their viewpoints. I say this not to normatively exonerate, but to raise questions about their pragmatist social action in a more nuanced 
and compound way. So perhaps Adil would like to say more about this context. I will end by noting the significance of the work in this moment. It's particularly timely to be discussing a work on the history of the Nakba now in 2022, as we continue to be a historical, to be at a historical impasse and as and as a settler colonial violence is only entrenched. How we understand the Nakba, not just as a historical event, but as a structure and as a process that shapes access to power and resources and sovereignty matters. We must return to originary moments because they teach us of all the alternative possibilities that could have been and still could be. We do history after all, to understand our present condition and change them. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Arij. Uh, Adil, can you hear us? I think Adil may be logging back on. While he does so, thank you, Arij, for your comments. I especially appreciated your discussion about microhistory and your attention to the capaciousness and inclusiveness of Adil's sources and methods, that he doesn't just rely on the state archives, but also gives full credit and full due to the Palestinian Nakba survivors themselves, the ones who waged Sira al-Baqa, who also um, survived, I mean, survived with the trauma and survived with the determination to, uh, to, to stay. Uh, I think your last uh, sort of section about his uh, treatment of the Israeli Communist Party, I think is also really important. Uh, I think we have Adil back now. Yes, can you hear us, Adil? I am, I am back. I, I, I didn't understand what happened, whether the problem was from my uh, computer or from Arij. I didn't hear the, the, the last phase of her talk. So she concluded by reiterating what a wonderful book you've written. Okay. <laughs> and, any, and criti so any critique? So you heard what she said about the um, treatment of the Communist Party and the uh, Communist leaders? Yeah, I, 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 I heard her when she was speaking about the black box. And, uh -huh. and so, yeah, I, I, I heard part of it, yeah. So one of the things that she uh, brought up that I would also love for you to address as well right. in your remarks is this question of um, whether or not there could be a bit more disaggregation about how we talk about the Communist Party membership, some of whom, as Arish just mentioned, were themselves Nekba survivors and internally displaced refugees. So mm -hmm. if you'd like to address that, that would be wonderful. And other, any other remarks that you have? Okay, uh, <clears throat> so should I start? I mean, please I go start? ahead. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Maha, uh, for your kind words and your introduction, uh, and thank you, Arij, for uh, your generosity in speaking about uh, my book. Uh, I mean, I, I I thought you will pose more questions and critique to my book uh, than uh, I heard. Uh, in any case, I, unlike both of you, uh, I didn't prepare a, a text because I thought I will respond more to the questions and to the review of Arij. So I'll be speaking, uh, not formally, not reading my paper or text, and I hope my English will help me enough to, uh, uh, because as you know, English is not my mother tongue. Uh, and I'm not from the young generation like Arij who uh, learn languages uh, quickly. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'll, 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 I, I want also to th thank uh, Laura and all uh, the people of the IPS and all the people who work for organizing uh, this event. Uh, it's very important uh, for me, uh, though it's uh, by Zoom, but by Zoom we reach uh, much, many more people uh, uh, in the world. So um, I'm happy this is the first uh, book event uh, or discussion of my book in English. 
there were discussions of the book in Arabic and Hebrew, plenty of them actually. Uh, so uh, allow me before responding to what Arish said, uh, say a few things uh, about uh, this book uh, and the circumstances of uh, writing it uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a, a, a personal a, a experience, which I didn't write about it uh, so far, though I mentioned it uh, in, in, uh, in the book, but without names. Uh, when I came to Jerusalem 50 years ago from the Galilee, I mean, I studied the, my undergraduate in Haifa University, and then I came to make my MA thesis and then PhD in the Hebrew University. So in the early 70s, probably 73, uh, I approached my professor, Gabriel Baer, well-known uh, historian, social historian of Egypt and other uh, Arab uh, countries, Middle Eastern countries. And I told him uh, that uh, I would like him uh, to guide uh, my uh, MA thesis. And then he asked, uh, do you have a topic to, uh, in mind to write about? And I said, yes. And he said, what? I said, Harakat al-Ard, the, uh, the land movement. Uh, uh, for those who, who don't know what's the land movement, it's a the first political movement of Palestinians in Israel uh, on a national basis in the late 50s. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, it, uh, uh, the Israelis didn't allow this movement to become a party uh, and the Supreme Court also didn't allow it. So uh, he looked on me and said, Adel, do you want a position in the future in the Israeli academia? And naively, I responded quickly, yes, sure. And he said, in that case, stay away from this uh, topic. And uh, that's how I became a historian of Palestine uh, during the Ottoman period. I mean, I wanted to, to, to write something about my experience, about what I ha heard from my family, from my uh, father, mother, other relatives. Uh, and I, I, spoke, I spoke about the land, uh, you know, the land movement as, as a topic, because I will not tell him uh, I went to, to, you know, to write about uh, the history of my family. Then I, I went and wrote my MA thesis uh, about Palestine in the early 17th century, far enough from the 20th century, early 17th century. That was my MA thesis. And then uh, when I came to write my PhD thesis, or uh, uh, I, I wrote it about the early 19th century, uh, Jerusalem between the French invasion and uh, the Muhammad Ali invasion, uh, 18, 19, 1799, 1831, but the, uh, the, the issue of what happened to the Palestinians during the Nakba and after in the Galilee, uh, which was part of my childhood, as, as you mentioned, or uh, I mean, the, the, I heard that story from my father first time in 58. And I, I was astonished. I mean, I, I didn't hear about all those things before 58. Uh, uh, so uh, so it, it was like a, a pain in my uh, back head. And uh, all the time I was thinking when the time will come uh, to write this book. Uh, but as usual, uh, we, we got busy uh, with the urgent uh, issues and we leave the important issues for later time. Uh, and I'm happy that uh, in the end of the day, uh, I was able uh, to write uh, this book in Arabic and it published uh, uh, in Arabic and Hebrew. I mean, I wrote Arabic, uh, the Arabic and Hebrew versions. And uh, the, I'm happy that uh, uh, the book was translated into English and people can read that book uh, nowadays in English too. 
Uh, after this uh, introduction, uh, again, I, I would like to, to thank Arij for her a kind review of, of the book. I, I am happy that uh, that what Arij uh, thinks about uh, my book. Uh, and I am aware that among Arab readers in general, but basically Palestinian readers, there was a big fuss about uh, uh, chapter three. Uh, now, I'm not aware uh, about any critique of that chapter from non-communists. I mean, if, if you know about uh, uh, scholars who wrote a, a, a critique of that chapter uh, who are not communists, uh, please let me know because I'm not aware about, about it. Uh, you do, Arij, go ahead. My criticism, I'm not a communist, so this I'm no, no, I know you are not a communist. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, uh, before, before this evening, I am not aware. That, that's what I said. I mean, particularly written, published a critique. I, so I, I, I heard you, so I'm, I know you are not communist. So it, uh, anyway, so uh, now <clears throat> to my mind, uh, the, uh, the reading of that chapter, and other things written about the communists and their role in the 50s is, is more political and uh, more influenced uh, with our, uh, by our knowledge about the role of the communists in the 50s and in the 60s. And I speak about it in the book. It's, it's, uh, it's not the case that I'm uh, just criticizing uh, the, uh, the communists about what they did in 48. And uh, I, I do acknowledge, I, I know, I mean, I, there is knowledge and acknowledgement of the role of the communists uh, 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 in the 50s and the 60s under military control. Uh, and I hope that I made justice to their role uh, during those years. Now, I was astonished. I mean, I, 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 I share with you my astonishment when I read El Ittihad for 10 years between 48 and 58. And I found there a, a text and, and, and statements which astonished me. For instance, every year on the eve of the so-called Independence Day, Al-Ittihad would have a big, uh, a big title. Sorry? Headline. Headline. Yeah. headline. The, yeah, the, headline. the, the yeah. headline of Al-Ittihad uh, on the eve of uh, 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 the Independence Day would be, we will celebrate the, the independence of Israel and defend its borders. This will be in 59, in 49, 50, 51, 52, until 55, the first time that the communist party uh, or the co Arab communist by Ittihad did not uh, declare that was in 56. And the first time that they said, this is not our independence uh, and we shouldn't celebrate uh, the independence of Israel was in 58. Okay, with the demonstration also after that in Nazareth and so on. So uh, what, what I'm criticizing, uh, uh, the, it's, it's not the, all the communists, uh, Arij. I know that the, there were communists who were victims of the, uh, of the Nakba. I know about that. Even Emir Habibi himself, his family, uh, most of his family, were uh, depopulated and the, the Israel did not allow them to come back, including the well-known story about his uh, brother uh, Naim and uh, his mother crying day after day and speaking about what happened to you, Naim, and so on and so forth. So, and, and his first story, Bawabit Mandelbaum, uh, that he, this was the first story that he published and I mention it also uh, in my book. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware uh, of the suffering of some communists, but 
in addition to that, not all the communists accepted uh, the role that Tawfiq Tubi, Emil Habibi, and Fuan Nassar decided to take. So uh, Emil Tuma, as we know, was different. Uh, Bulus Farah was different. So there were some who uh, decided differently. Uh, and uh, to come back uh, to the, uh, the, the real issue, the real question here about the role of the, of the communists in 48, my critique is not about uh, all the communists, about those communists led by those three. And uh, I'm a historian. I mean, I mean, my reading of what they did or what they didn't do, and by this I'm answering Maha actually one of your questions later, so we don't have to dwell into it, uh, is, is more uh, uh, the critique of the narrative that they built and that they marketed to the Palestinians in Israel and everywhere. They marketed a narrative or a historiography that we were the heroes in 1948. We were, we the communists, we were the, uh, the only Palestinians, not only that accepted the 40, a seven a partition plan. That's okay. I mean, everybody knows that when Moscow, when Stalin decided to change a, 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 the Soviet Union policy towards Zionism and nation, a, nationalism after the Second World War, a, and he decided to support a, the, a, the partition plan and, a, and, and thought that a Zionism is not anymore a colonial power or settler colonialism or whatever, but rather a national movement for liberation. So you can't stay com a communist and be against Stalin. I mean, that's clear for me. What, is, what I found really strange is that those communists of the LL, uh, how uh, the liberation, uh, uh, the national, the NLL, sorry, the national uh, liberation, uh, national, the Osma, national Osma liberation. Yeah, mm -hmm. national liberation, uh, uh, yeah, uh, front. So, so when the Osma Tahrur, now those people who accepted this line went, uh, went, you know, too far to my mind. I mean, they they were not just. Uh, survivors, they decided to cooperate with the Zionist project. I mean, unlike their position until 47, I mean, I, I compared uh, what they said and what they did in 48, one in, in comparison to what El Etihad itself and, uh, and the Liberation, uh, National Liberation uh, League said until 47. Emil Tuma in particular, as the editor of Al-Ittihad. And, and it's, it's a 100, a, a, a 180 degrees change to the opposite. I mean, not, a, a, not colonialism and not, and not a movement which will bring war and the problems to the area, but rather a liberation movement, a, a national movement, and they have the right they have the right of self-determination in Palestine. That's the meaning of the partition plan, that they accepted the right of the Zionist movement, which is, to my mind, and to many others, is a settler colonial movement. They have the same rights, or even more rights, uh, to a state in Palestine than the Palestinians themselves. As we know, as all of us know, the Palestinians were two-thirds of the population, and they got less than half of the country of Palestine, historical Palestine in the partition plan. But after that, after accepting the, uh, uh, the partition plan in February, not before, we don't know how that decision was made. Who attended that, uh, that meeting in Nazareth? We just know about a, a meeting in Nazareth. No date, no exact date, no exact place for that decision. 
And it was clear that three people mainly, Fuad Nassar, Emil Habibi, and Tawfiq Toubi, took, this, uh, took that decision. Boulos Farah, for instance, said that he wasn't invited. He didn't know uh, about uh, that meeting. And others also said the same. But Emil Touma, it seems that he was there, and he was against the partition plan. Now, uh, to go back to my main point, my main point is I'm a historian. I, I read for many years about the role of the uh, communist uh, during the Nakba and after the Nakba. And they were only heroes. The, the communists were only heroes. And they, uh, they, uh, they marketed a, 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 a macro history speaking about the communists who stopped uh, depopulating Palestinians in, in the Galilee. So why Palestinians stayed in the Galilee? Because the communists prevented their expulsion. That's what the, the, the communists were saying. And I found out, sorry, uh, do you want me to finish? Uh, I'll, 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 I'll conclude uh, immediately and let us move to other topics. So the, the, uh, that, uh, I mean, that uh, history or narrative that the, the communists marketed was against the fact that I found uh, in their paper and in, the, what, in their writing and in other documents, uh, the, there is no one case during 48 where the communists have a, a, a prevented the expulsion of Palestinians from any village or any city in the Galilee or in other, uh, other place. So they were ready to cooperate uh, with Israel from February 48 on to cooperate with Israel ideologically, not as collaborators like the Zobis and others, uh, but uh, they, they thought that this is their role as socialists, as, as communists, to support the, the creation of Israel as a Jewish state, which will bring socialism and communism to the Middle East. Uh, now, if they were saying that the best that we could do during the Nakba, I would understand, but that wasn't uh, the narrative that uh, they marketed for the people. And as a historian, I, I discovered here something very important, and I thought it's very important to put it in writing what they did in 48 and what they did after 48. And uh, that, that, that's uh, very important for, to my mind. Thank you. Thank you for that, Adil, and thank you for the explanation. I think it really clarifies one of the most uh, contentious elements of the reception of the book, especially the Arabic edition mm -hmm. um, in Palestinian circles. We have a number of other questions. Several of them relate to the question of methodology and the use of oral history. Mm -hmm. How did you elicit testimonials from Nakba survivors, oftentimes recounting traumatic events? and oftentimes recounting events that happened several decades prior. So a kind of cluster of questions around how you got the material and then how you treated the material uh, with the understanding that memories can erode, that things can change and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this is very important uh, questions, how, how uh, we use uh, oral history uh, with all the problems of uh, memory and uh, you know what happens to our memory after tens of years when you speak about something uh, that happened 40 or 50 or 60 years uh, ago now to begin with i decided that i will interview only eyewitnesses to events i didn't uh, interview anybody who told me I heard from a relative or from my father that this is what happened in our village. Only eyewitnesses. Now, uh, to my mind, and not only to my mind, uh, but the uh, social uh, uh, so scholars of uh, social studies and whether psychologists and others know that uh, uh, when you witness uh, or, uh, or have a practice of, uh, of a trauma, uh, that trauma uh, uh, stays uh, in, in, in your memory and you don't forget as a victim 
uh, of a trauma of, 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 of expulsion or massacre for that uh, matter, you don't forget uh, what happened to you. Now, several people who will be in that event, let's say of massacre or of expulsion, they may uh, tell us the story differently in details, but the core story would be the same core story. And that's what I found in Majd al Krum, in Ayla Boon, and in many other localities that I interviewed more than one, more than four, more than 10 people uh, sometimes. So to go back to the, uh, the methodology of using those uh, uh, testimonies, I, I started by asking uh, the interviewee uh, uh, where he was uh, in, in, in 48 and, and then telling his story without asking questions, telling the story of what happened in, in his village, what, what he recalled, what, what do he remember from the events in his uh, or her village. I mean, uh, most of the interviewees were uh, men, but there were uh, some women also. Uh, now, if I felt that he is exaggerating, or uh, I mean, I, I should say that before going to those in interviews, I read all the uh, primary and secondary sources that I know about them in Arabic, Hebrew, and English about what happened in 48. I mean, I was uh, 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 well acquainted with the events before going to interview. And uh, most of the interviewees were uh, interviewed by me and not my others. So uh, again, uh, I, I, I heard I listened uh, to the story and then I started asking questions. And many times, uh, if somebody uh, told me that in this village, uh, 50 or 70 people were, were, were killed, then I, I asked, can you tell me uh, the names of 10 of those 70? And when uh, the interviewee has started uh, mentioning one, two, three or four names and then no more, I said, you don't remember any more? I mean, from the 70, you said 70. Well, maybe it's not 70, maybe it was less. And, and but it, it's, it's, it's the way of, a, a, you know, a, a checking our sources, whether it's a document or a memoir. I mean, every source have its privileges and, uh, 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 you know, and, you know, how, how we say the negative uh, facts yeah, about. Happens. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so I decided that oral testimony or oral documents are a document or documents like other doc other documents from the archive or from memoirs or whatever, and we have to check them and to compare them with other sources. And so, so some people, for instance, some of the interviewees uh, in Tarshiha, for instance. There were four or five people, and every one of them said that he was an eyewitness. And I started listening to, to their stories. And one of them it was clear uh, to me uh, that he is not telling the truth, that, uh, that, he's, uh, that he's fantasizing, or, or, or I, I don't know. Uh, and uh, I, I decided at one point that I'm, I'm stopping the interview with him. I'm not taking his words because uh, it was contradicting to all the other interviewees. So when I felt that an interview is not accurate, uh, I decided uh, not to accept it. I, I'm a historian, I'm, tell, I'm trying to reconstruct uh, history, to, to construct facts on the ground. So if, if that interview or what he, I was told was against all other sources, I decided not to use it, not uh, uh, so. Uh, and uh, once again, I, I used the oral testimonies together with all other sources. I didn't depend solely on the oral testimonies. There are scholars who from anthropology, from other uh, fields of study, 
who use oral history, and uh, 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 but as a historian, I thought oral testimonies are very important. It's important to use them, but we have to use them together with uh, other sources in order to reconstruct real events on the ground in the, in the case of Palestine in 48 and after. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that comprehensive answer and the ways in which oral history isn't taken at face value, but is checked against numerous other sources. Mm -hmm. We only have five minutes left. So uh, the last question I wanted to ask you, you mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago that most of your interviewees were men, but you also interviewed some women. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the role of women, both in the struggle for survival as well as their roles of other forms of resistance in 1948? Well, uh, the, the first interviewee uh, 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 about what happened in 48 was my mom. Because uh, after uh, hearing uh, the, the story of our expulsion and return from Lebanon uh, from my father, uh, and uh, I, I went to my mom, uh, my father was going to work, uh, that, that was, I was 10, 15, 12 years old, and I start asking her, uh, what was the kind of life that we had in Ain al Hilwe, in the refugee camp, and how, how, how did we manage, how did we survive in uh, two years and a half uh, as refugees in Ain al Hilwe, and what happened in the day of return, she was pregnant, how did she feel and so on and so forth. And after coming back uh, to the village, uh, which kind, I mean, how, how did we start uh, our life again in our home? Uh, because my grandma uh, was uh, in the village and she kept our house. Uh, and then I, I interviewed my grandma and in other villages, I did interview few women like uh, in, in, in Tarshiha, for instance, I interviewed uh, Suad Bshara. Uh, uh, the wife of a uh, well-known uh, uh, Christian, uh, uh, sorry, uh, communist, uh, uh, co uh, communist leader, and and in in other places, but it was more difficult, you know, for me uh, to interview more women, though I am aware that they have a, a role. Uh, but in 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 our society, uh, you know, the the men. Uh, take the role as if they were the heroes and they did that and they did uh, uh, the other things and the, the women are uh, marginalized in the story. Uh, and it, it wasn't even uh, easy for me uh, also to interview men in other villages because in the beginning, uh, some of the people weren't sure why I'm coming and uh, to, uh, asking them about 48, uh, Maybe I am working with the government, with the, with the security services or something like that. It, it took some time, some time and more than one visit. In the first visit and interview, I heard something. But in the second and third and fourth interviews, and there were people that I interviewed four or five and more times, they, they, after I built the trust, uh, with uh, what I'm doing, and they heard our, about our story, my family story, what happened in Majdik Room, uh, I, I heard the new things that they didn't want to, to, to speak about in, in the first time and then later on. So it was more difficult uh, uh, to have the same experience with women with, with all of the restrictions of relations uh, of somebody who comes from out of the village and it wants to, to, to sit with men, women and speak to them about 48. Uh, so, but but uh, uh, as I said, they, they had a role, uh, but in a traditionalist uh, 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 society, like the rural society of uh, the Palestinians in the Galilee in, in, in 48, uh, their, their role uh, was marginalized. They had a role, but their role was marginalized. Maha, Thank if you so I may, please. If 
my reading to this point specifically of Ada's work, I find it very important because if we look or envision the Nakba as a process, the women and the way Adil actually perceive the role of women in the quotidian life of steadfastness, of conveying the story and not just the story and memory, but rather living the details of, for example, what happened to his grandma. This really can teach us about how women and Palestinian women specifically, when we don't draw just on maneuvers, wars, military actions, and etc., history unfolds differently. And I think in this specific point, I found Adel's work really important, perceptive, and bringing another perspective in reading history differently. Just in, in this point, this is what I feel, especially I would recommend for all to read the preface and the introduction because there he talks more about these details and actually I was like this was um, one of my first texts reading about 48 Adel in your, uh, in your article in Arabic, Siptil mm -hmm. that I really learned. It's in English too. It's in English oh, too. It's in English. Nice. So I, I uh, responded back and uh, remembered the moments when I read this text, how I learned about it, about how women, with, if we don't just talk about Nakba as, as you know, the expulsion and mm -hmm. what's happened, but the details of protecting their family, of the ways they perform uh, history unfold differently. Thank you, Adel, for that. Shukran, shukran, Argis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you both. And so just to sum up, I think that Adel, your book, uh, just to sort of sum up my own uh, assessment too, I think that this discussion with Arish too has really brought out the importance of your book, not just in contributing empirical knowledge, to what happened to Palestinians in 1948, but really also provides a roadmap for historians about how to get at elements of history that are not found in state archives or in military or political narratives. The quotidian uh, experiences of Palestinians, men and women, aren't, um, aren't found there. And so they need to be found through oral history. But I think in your last point of what you just said about the, the relationship building and the trust building that needs to happen between the researcher and the interviewees, mm -hmm. I think it's also really important to think about the ethics of conducting oral history. Mm -hmm. And I think your book really lays that out very clearly about the, the, again, the relationship and trust building that needs to happen. That researchers can't just fly in do a two hour interview, fly out and think they've gotten the whole story, that it really needs to be grounded, which then also speaks to the importance of Palestinian historians doing the history, the history of Palestine yeah, to be able to bring their experience, Maha, because Maybe I didn't mention that, by, uh, but I think Adels is the first Palestinian refugee infiltrator to write the history of the Nakba. And this yeah. is really the way your experience is uh, entrenched in the book is very important. I think it should encourage more Palestinian scholars to bring the, the history of Palestine to be able for all of us to forbid another future ethnic cleansing. And this was one of the questions that was mentioned in the questions. I think we can't uh, negate any possibility, but I am sure that with the resilience and the resistance and the quotidian existence of Palestinian in Israel, we together should prohibit that and we won't leave. This is the, the, the message that we will sell and be there. So not only, as Palestinians say, is the Nakba ongoing, but Sira al-Baqa is also ongoing. And it will continue, I think. And I think it will be enlivened and strengthened and given more foundation as more and more Palestinians and more and more supporters of Palestinians read uh, Adil's book, Nakba and Survival. And so with that, I want to thank uh, Adil and Arij for joining us. I think it's... Uh, quite late where you both are. Uh, I want to thank the Institute for Palestine Studies for publishing Adel's Arabic edition of this book and helping facilitate its English translation as well, along with the University of California Press. This session is recorded and I believe will be posted. 
And it was also, it should be available through Facebook as well. So once again, thanks to Laura Lebost and Stephen Bennett for Thank organizing. You. Thank you to all of you for attending and uh, go out and get, uh, here it is, this book right here, Nakba and Survival, and here's the Arabic, there it is. So go get them and thank you all very much and we will see you uh, next time. Thank you, Maha, thank you all. Shukran.